Thank you. What a wonderful past few days it's been. I'm delighted to have been asked to come to talk to you about NapaDebt, but of course, what I'll show and talk about today is no single author effort. So the NapaDebt Research Project is a huge collaborative effort. There are researchers, colleagues, museum staff, students, fossil hunters, communities um, that are all a part of that. And so I wanna begin by acknowledging the many individuals who are all co-authors of this talk. And of course, no talk about Napa debt can be had without acknowledging and taking a moment to remember my former co-director, Isaiah Nengo, who passed shortly after Richard early last year. Isaiah was passionately dedicated to the work at Napa debt, his work at TBI, and the communities in the surrounding areas. He made numerous discoveries, including some of which I'll talk about today. And I want to just express my immense gratitude for the invitation, encouragement, and support by Isaiah, Lawrence, and Richard, who was Isaiah's very close mentor. As we've seen, one important part of honoring their legacy is carrying on our work in the basin. And it's a real privilege that I have that honor at NAPADET. So today I wanna to introduce you to Napadet, which is uh, perhaps a relatively new uh, locality compared to some of those we've already talked about. I will provide an overview of the paleontological and geological investigations there, discuss the fauna and specifically middle Miocene primates, uh, including some new discoveries. And I will focus in particular on the functional and evolutionary anatomy as well as the significance of an eight partial skeleton. And uh, with a few moments left, I hope, uh, discuss some new directions for the project. So Napadet is a paleontological locality in northern Kenya on the west side of Lake Turkana. It is just south of TBI Turkwell in the Turkwell River and just west of Lothagum. A series of fossiliferous areas were discovered during survey by the Kubi-4 Research Project in the early 1990s. Uh, they were looking for Pliocene sites and wandered into what we now know as the Red Series. It's been worked ever since. Um, it was returned to in 2013 uh, by the KFRP along with Isaiah Nengo. Um, and since then, Isaiah and a moment to acknowledge the contributions, especially by uh, Craig Feibel, Ellen Miller, and Tara Smiley. And more recently, Napadet has held a central position as one of the only Middle Miocene sites um, in the area that's involved in the Turkana Miocene project. While its paleontological investigation really started in the early 90s, the hills were part of reconnaissance geological work in 1959 to 1960, later reported on by Dodson. Um, in that report, he noted sedimentary strata of interest, including tufts and ashes in the areas surrounding the hills. McDougall and Brown provided a date on a columnar basalt we now know is part of the, the lower basalt in the series, a date of 12.8. And Craig Feibel, since at least 2013, I think perhaps earlier, has been a really key figure in understanding the quite complex geology of Napadet. Additional key pieces of information, including forthcoming dates on previously undated basalts, dates on the petrified wood that you've heard about yesterday, are all being generated more recently by the Turkana Miocene Project. So the stratigraphy of Napadet is published in the 2017 Nengo et al. Nature paper. There are three primary fossil bearing intervals of interest, Pliocene sediments of the Nachkui formation, um, and you can see there at 4.1, the base of Lake Lanyaman. Beneath that is what we've informally termed the Red Series, and then the Amunyan Beds. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these. So we warmly refer to the areas uh, north and west of sort of central Napadet as the Pliocene leaky sites. We need to clearly distinguish these from the Miocene sediments at Napadet. They do also, though, cap areas of the Red Series, as you'll see in a moment. Roughly 90% of our fauna are identified to the family level or below, and among primates are primarily circopithecoids, though there is also some very fragmentary hominin material. Underlying the lake is, again, informally the Red Series. There are places north and south, as shown in the map there, comprised of red sandstones and conglomerates. 
Thus far, it doesn't yield any datable materials, um, but we know it has to be older than 4.1 as it lies below the lake and probably younger than uh, the Middle Miocene. So possibly containing sediments spanning mid-late Miocene, perhaps the Pliocene. Given the possible late Miocene date, the fossils are of considerable interest. Uh, the fossils from this strata though, however, are also considerably beat up. So uh, they are currently under study. Uh, we're continuing investigation working in these series and are obviously keen on finding uh, or identifying anything that'll help us nail down that late Miocene date, uh, including taxa that don't cross that Miocene-Pliocene boundary. And of course, what Napadet is best known for are the ammonium beds located centrally. These fossil bearing strata are dominated by bedded and polychrome tufts underlain by a columnar basalt flow that was dated in the 2017 paper to 13.3. Roughly 70% of our fauna derived from these beds. A number of the fossils are under study and some are published. We recently published work in Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology earlier this year, was led by Michael Morlow um, on the carnivores from Napadet showing we have a new species of giant amphicyanid. The ammonia beds are also well known for our fossil forest. These beds preserve fossil wood, and there are several areas where the fossil trees are preserved upright in situ. Uh, trees, along with the phytolith data from the site, tell us that forested and woodland habitats probably existed on the landscape. A number of important primate fossils derive from the ammonium beds. Of course, it's best known for the nearly complete infant cranium of Nyanzopithecus alezi. This was described in 2017, but what I wanna focus on today are the primates that have been discovered since. Many of these come from a site we call Red Hill. <clears throat> You can see it's there located in sort of the lower part of those upper polychrome tufts. This is an incredibly important site. It documents quite a bit of primate taxonomic and ecological diversity. It's also known for the first primate discovery at Napadet, a pretty beat up ape canine. However, more recent Red Hill work has actually yielded adult alezi, including an upper and a lower M3. And that lower M3 is going to be the first known for that species. These teeth corroborate the impression from that type specimen that the species size is slightly larger than Nyanzopithecus pickfordi. The lower M3 is very derived, actually resembling Oreopithecus, which also in that regard shows us that Analezi is more advanced than Nyanzopithecus pickfordi. From Red Hill, there are also two lower molars, an M3 and probably an M2 of what appears to be Kenyapithecus. It largely resembles the Fort Turnin material and given the sort of scant and finite Fort Turnin sample, these teeth from Napadet are going to be both important and exciting in providing uh, new information and a new opportunity to learn about this taxon. We also have a Galligan mandible. This preserves the M3 and an unassociated distal humerus. The mandible tentatively shows affinities with Comba, um, which we know from early and middle Miocene sites, uh, also including Maboko. But what I wanna provide detail about today with you is an ape partial skeleton that we have from a different site in the Ammonium beds, Hallelujah Hill. You can see it's uh, just north of the uh, bedded tufts from which you find a lezi in those polychrome tufts in that same section. Why I wanna focus on the ape partial skeleton is to highlight the importance of continuing to search for middle Miocene localities in the basin and elsewhere. The middle, middle Miocene is a very important time period in ape evolution. It's when we start to see a move away from pronograde adapted, predominantly quadrupedal positional behaviors of early Miocene taxa like Proconsul and Akembo toward more forelimb dominated behaviors that are later found among some late Miocene apes and of course crown apes. However, there are few postcrania from East African middle Miocene hominoids. It includes scant remains attributed to Kenyapithecus from Fort Turnin and partial skeletons of Nocholopithecus from Nochola and Equatorius from Kipsaramon. 
However, the two partial skeletons of these latter are considerably damaged and distorted, uh, precluding comparisons, particularly quantitative ones. These aside, there are no other reported ape postcranial specimens from East Africa between 15 and 7 million years. Enter Napadet. In 2015, we discovered elements of an ape partial postcranial skeleton at Napadet. And since then, as you can imagine, a considerable amount of our fieldwork has been de dedicated to recovering that skeleton. Here's what we have for the skeleton, KNM NP64631. The panel on the right shows some of the more functionally informative pieces, but there are more than 70 postcranial specimens representing the vertebral column, shoulder, hip, elbow, ankle joints, as well as the hands and feet. There are no craniodental remains. What I'd like to focus on is the comparative and functional anatomy of this skeleton of some of the more recent finds. <clears throat> we make comparisons to extant anthropoids and some extinct, mostly African, Miocene apes. Of the femur, shown on the right in the red box now, is all we have preserved is the femoral head and partial neck. However, the femoral head is quite spherical and projects proximally from the neck as in other hominoids and unlike in monkeys, indicating there was probably good overall hip joint mobility in multiple planes. Of course, from the femoral head, we can glean important body size information. Uh, we use published regression equations to estimate body size from the supero inferior diameter of the femoral head. And the estimated body size of the Napadet ape is roughly between 13 and a half to 16 and a half kilograms. Uh, this is comparable for reference to ranges for some baboon species, some large bodied colobines, and is a bit bigger than siamangs. Here's a bivariate plot of log radial head max diameter against log mid lumbar medial lateral breadth. The Napadet ape is shown by two stars, one for each lumbar vertebra. Platterines are in purple, cercopithecoids in blue, and hominoids in red. And the takeaway here is that for its vertebral size, the Napadet ape has a large radial head, falling above the hominoid line along which Akembo falls. Here we've quantified the bevel angle of the radial head. A larger angle shown as values to the right um, and is exhibited by most monkeys indicates less radial head beveling, reflecting a shallower corresponding humeral zona conoidea that together will provide stability at the elbow joint, especially in pronated arm positions, as is assumed during quadrupedal locomotion. A smaller angle shown as values to the left and is exhibited by most extant apes, extant apes and its helis indicates more radial head beveling, which articulates with a deeper humeral zona conoidea and provides stability as the radial head as it moves and rotates through pronation and supination movements as during forelimb dominated activities. The value for the Napadet ape radius shown as that star falls within the lower range of the extant ape distribution as well as its helis. This reflects a more derived elbow condition compared to cercopithecoids, and in this way also differs from akembo and epipliopithecus, which have relatively less beveled radial heads. Here's a comparative panel of lumbar vertebrae shown in top, from top to bottom, ventral, cranial, and lateral views. There's extant papio on the left, extant pongo on the right, sandwiching akembo, nicholopithecus, the napadet ape, and one of the barotopithecus vertebra. <clears throat> the Napadet ape lumbar vertebrae are most similar in their size, shown here highlighted as cranial articular surface area. Their body proportions and their shape to those of Nocholopithecus, and those are all outlined in that red box. In particular, the Napadet specimen NP66 resembles quite a bit the 35250 skeleton lumbar vertebra R shown there right next to it, and that's really evident in a cranial view. These box plots show variation in an index of transverse process position relative to the medial lateral breadth of the cranial articular surface, which in our scan samples scales isometrically both within and among the primate clades sampled. 
Values for the Napa debt ape fall between the values for mid-lumbar verts for cir cercopithecoids on one hand, shown toward uh, the left, which have more ventrally positioned transverse processes, reflecting an emphasis on spinal flexion during quadrupedal walking and running. And on the other hand, toward the right, exhibited by Atelis, Alawada, Gibbons, Hylobatids in general, and especially the great apes, all have more dorsally positioned transverse processes associated with a more dorsostable spine as would be needed during uh, upright positional behaviors. And the transverse processes of the Napa dead ape, you can see are not as dorsally positioned as those of the one Merodopithecus lumbar vertebra, um, but perhaps are slightly more dorsally positioned than a Cumbo or Nicholopithecus, though all of that variation for those latter taxa could probably be sampled within a taxon. There are two fragments of a pollicle proximal phalanx that we were able to join in order to estimate thumb length. These box plots show variation in a ratio of pollicle proximal phalanx length relative to the supero inferior diameter of the femoral head. Values to the left indicate relatively short thumbs. Values to the right indicate relatively long thumbs. The napadet specimen shown as the star uh, has a relatively long thumb falling within the range of hylobatids um, and platyrines and near akembo. And for most Miocene apes, a long thumb has been associated with assisting and powerful grasping during arboreal locomotion. We have a left medial cuneiform bone of the foot shown here in medial and distal views compared to a selection of um, other Miocene hominoids. The first metatarsal facet was able to be segmented from the medial cuneiform, and its curvature was quantified. These box plots show variation in that curvature, with values to the left showing less mediolaterally curved first metatarsal facets, and values to the right showing more mediolaterally curved first metatarsal facets. Hominoids tend to have increased curvature <clears throat> compared to cercopithecoids, and the Napa dead specimen has marked mediolateral curvature, falling within the ranges of variation for hominoids and alawada and situated within the range of akembo variation. Interestingly, the Nicholopithecus specimen appears to have a somewhat flattened for set or flattened reduced curvature. Um, however, as you can see with extant pan, all of the variation for those Miocene hominoids could be sampled within a single taxon. Overall, the Napa dead ape exhibits mobile joints, indicated by sphericity and projection of that femoral head, and while not shown today, a very globular humeral capitulum with a deep zona conoidea that's gonna articulate with that very beveled radial head I showed earlier, all of which are pronounced to earlier Miocene apes. The bones of the elbow joint in particular are quite large relative to some other skeletal elements and there's a long first ray and the curved, very curved medial cuneiform um, MT1 facet implies well-developed grasping of the hands and feet like other Miocene hominoids. Not shown today, but there's also part of the talocrural joint that shows consistency with mobility and dorsiflexion and inversion that would be associated with climbing. All of the above support an inference of a reliance on more forelimb dominated activities, such as perhaps vertical climbing or orthograde clambering, with the forelimbs playing a more important role in body support compared to earlier Miocene apes. In its morphology and inferred functional anatomy, the Napa dead ape most clearly or most re closely resembles middle Miocene ape Nicholopithecus from Nichola, also in Kenya but south of Napa dead. There are slight differences, including body size estimates. Uh, while the Napa dead ape resembles perhaps a small bodied Nicholopithecus, without cranial remains, craniodental remains, the null hypothesis of what it might be still has to include other taxa known from Napa dead, from which we only know from teeth, cranial dental remains. The Napa dead ape postcranial skeleton is much smaller bodied than Equatorius or Kenyapithecus. It lacks any sort of terrestrial adaptations as well, so it's unlikely to be that. Could it be a lezzy? Well, little postcrania are known from Nyansopithecus. However, body size reconstructions from the infant cranium and the adult Nyansopithecus alezi specimens yield body sizes of around nine to 11 kilograms. So that would be smaller than our estimated ranges for the Napa dead ape, but further Nyansopithecine postcrania are needed. 
Though its attribution remains unclear at present, the Napadet ape postcranial skeleton has great importance as the only other postcranial skeletons known from East African Middle Miocene hominoids, Nicholopithecus and Equatorius, are crushed and distorted. So the relatively well-preserved morphology of the Napadet ape is gonna provide key information about the body plan and evolution of Middle Miocene apes. Since the Middle Miocene is also the time about which we start to see an increase in forelimb dominated behaviors, the skeleton serves as an important data point in the fossil record against which we can test hypotheses about the evolution of more upright positional behaviors that are later characteristic of crown apes. So additional work at Napadet and new Middle Miocene localities in the basin and elsewhere are needed to help understand the pathway by which we get the body plans of modern apes. And to take this one step further, the Middle Miocene is important because it tells us about what comes in in time period right before the appearance of hominins. In other words, the Middle Miocene and its ape players set the stage for the rise of hominins. With my remaining few moments, I wanna quickly turn to uh, situate this transition documented by, documented by the Napadet ape postcranial skeleton in a larger evolutionary context. And to do so, just briefly mention a project uh, in collaboration with Alan Miller and Tara Smiley that harnesses the strengths of two Miocene localities in the basin, Napadet in the much more scenic locality of Bullock. Our forthcoming work <clears throat> will examine faunal evolution among the Middle Miocene climatic optimum, which represents one of these major warming interruptions in what is otherwise sort of a long-term cooling trend in the last 50 million years. The Middle Miocene climatic optimum or warming occurred around 17 to 14 and a half, and past research has demonstrated that this seems to have corresponded with a large turnover, faunal turnover event, um, informally referred to as the early Middle Miocene transition. Bullock and Napadet are excellent localities for which to take, at this faunal, take a look at this faunal change because at roughly 17, Bullock sits, um, documents a fauna that sits on the cusp of this uh, MMCO. And at 13, Napadet documents a fauna in the aftermath of that warming event. In other words, they bookend the MMCO. We'll put this together with published faunal data from regional localities, including Pipsaramon at 15.5, Moboko at 15, and capture faunal change at roughly 500,000 year increments. Uh, we'll integrate taxonomic and ecological data to test hypotheses about lineage specific changes, including, for example, major transformations in the Caterine body plan, as well as first and last appearances, all within a comparative framework. And as the middle rising climatic optimum has been touted as the best analog for current day climate change, the results of our work will have importance for a number of fields beyond paleontology and paleontology, including conservation. And with a project that has significance for both paleontology and modern day mammalian conservation, we'd like to think that this is one that Richard would approve of. With that, I'd like to thank Lawrence, Fred, Alicia, and the other conference organizers, as well as Stony Brook, TBI, and National Geographic for putting on this truly wonderful event. And of course, the various museums and funding bodies that make our work at Napadet possible. Thank you.